Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Those of you that are old enough will remember when people got dressed up to fly, when having a meal on board, especially a transcontinental flight, was like dining in a fine restaurant, when in-flight service was more than peanuts and admonitions about the size of carry-on bags. It was also a time when those that provided that in-flight service were a different breed than Cassie Bowen and the flight attendant. It was a time when the job was not fungible with working in a casino or a Greyhound bus, especially on world-class airlines like Pan Am. It was an era when air travel was awash in glamour, not the horrors of today. The flight attendants, or stewardesses as they were known then, were a select group. They had to have the right look, the right body mass index, the right education, and speak more than one language, and abide by strict dress codes. By today's standards, the requirements would probably generate a class action discrimination suit that would put the airline out of business. We're going to talk about this era gone by today with my guest, Julia Cook. Her essays have been published in numerous publications. Her reporting has appeared in Condé Nast Traveler and the New York Times, as well as other publications. Her previous book is The Other Side of Paradise that looks at the new Cuba. And it is my pleasure to welcome Julia Cook here to talk about Come Fly the World, the jet age story of the women of Pan Am. Julia, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Jeff. It's great to have you here. Talk first about what a flying was like, what travel was like back in the late 60s and early 70s. You know, it, it was really glamorous. Um, and, you know, that glamour was partially a construction of the airlines themselves. The uh, airlines put a lot of effort into um, into making customers feel like they were, they were going to have a really glamorous experience, um, in part because uh, the prices were then um, set by the government. They were um, controlled. Uh, and, and so fares were not, they couldn't compete via fares, so airlines competed via image. Um, so, you know, they, they hired couturiers like Dior, Pucci, Cassini, and, and Don Loper to um, devise their uniforms. They hired the best architects of the day to um, design terminals and corporate headquarters. And, you know, they had, as you mentioned, the menus were designed by, um, on Pan Am, Maxims of Paris. Um, and so, so part of it was that uh, that corporate construction. Part of it was also just the fact of, um, you know, anything after the stability of the post-war 1950s and the prosperity, um, anything international held held a waft of of intrigue and glamour and excitement. Um, and the jet age was ushered in in 1958. Um, so this new technology was all of a sudden accessible. It made, made it rendered corners of the world accessible that had not been before. And the women that were the flight attendants of the day, stewardesses as they were called then, talk a little bit about them. Yeah. So, um, so the women of the day were uh, they were hired um, in in part to uphold that glamour. They, they were seen as another way that um, an airline could identify its brand and um, and uh, attract appeal to customers. Keep in mind that back then, um, a, a large number of the most frequent flyers were male. And so uh, women, pretty women, uh, were seen as another way that an airline could compete. And the rules, particularly at Pan Am, which you focus on in, in Come Fly the World, the rules were pretty strict. They were incredibly strict. Um, and and that's, that's one of the things that first intrigued me so much about this um, this subject was that the the kind of um, what seemed like a real contrast between uh, the objectification that these women were subjected to by the corporations that were sending them places. Um, you know, they 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 were seen as upholding this brand. They wanted to the airlines at least wanted them to, you know, be pretty and and young in order to appeal to their male travelers. And yet the women themselves um, found a huge amount of freedom in the role. They signed up in droves for this job. Um, in the 60s, high school seniors listed stewardess uh, as the most sought-after profession for, for young women. Um, they they really, really wanted it. And it was not just because it was a, seen as a glamorous job to have. It was because it offered them a huge amount of physical freedom. So they, they were able to, to travel the world on Pan Am. And the, the requirements were... Um, were partially 
physical. They had to be, as you mentioned, a certain height, a certain weight. Um, they had to look a certain way. They also had to be really smart, as you mentioned. They had to be. Uh, they had to speak multiple languages. They had to have at least some college education. And this was in an era in which only seven percent of American women graduated from college. Um, and they also had to be really able to to think on their feet. They were quizzed on. Um, on how to on different situations how they would react and they had to um, prove that they were able to really be uh, fast critical thinkers and and and, um, and diplomats they had to be able to appeal to um, or to speak you know to so many different kinds of people um, and to you know prove that they could handle themselves in any situation so these were a really select group of women as you mentioned so many people wanted this job the number of applicants that were accepted particularly at at Pan Am was very small it was so small it was something like 2 to 3% um of the applicants who who wanted the job actually got it so keep in mind you know compare that to Ivy League colleges of today it, it's <laughs> far more select and yet one of the things you point out is that in some cases the the parents or more specifically i guess the mothers of some of these women that really wanted to do this, the, the mothers didn't see the job in quite the same way. They didn't, um, and and that was in part because of the um, the efficacy of that corporate messaging. You know, <laughs> um, the, the corporations had you know, were trying to appeal to passengers by saying, you know, we have the prettiest, most pleasing stewardesses, and the moms of these very bright women were thinking, wait a minute, that's not what we raised you to do. We didn't put you through college to to go do that. Um, and, and you know, it was up to these younger women to really say to their parents, which they all did, um, look, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this because it is going to offer me access to the entire world. Um, I'm going to get to go to these different places. I'm going to be, um, you know, mixing with these important people. And, you know, the important people, it, it was, you know, very well known in that era that Pan Am was the airline that brought the Beatles to the U.S. They were, you know, most of the, I've seen photos of Liza Minnelli and like plenty of, tons of celebrities, every celebrity posed in front of a Pan Am plane or, or you know, um, if they were traveling internationally, they were probably traveling on Pan Am. But what was less known was that Pan Am ran um, the White House press charter plane. Um, so wherever Air Force One went, uh, a press charter traveled behind it, and um, the and Pan Am crewed that plane. It was a, a specific flight. Uh, Pan Am was chartered to um, to to do tons of refugee flights by the U.S. government, to do war flights, um, to to uh, fly foreign dignitaries around, um, diplomats. Uh, they, you name it. If someone was important in politics, they um, often they often flew Pan Am. While you were researching this book and and subsequent to it coming out, talk a little bit about the reaction that you've gotten and what you've heard from women that look back upon this era, and and perhaps from a contemporary perspective see it differently. Yeah. So one of the things that first. Uh, I can speak for myself partially, you know, I, so the reason why I, I, this book first occurred to me, uh, the, the Genesis story in a way of this book is that I went to an event, um, at the TWA air terminal. I'm in my late thirties now. Um, so back then I was in my early thirties, so six years ago. Um, and I, I met these two, uh, former stewardesses from Pan Am and I found them magnetic. They were just so exciting. They talked about, um, you know, I, I, I had anticipated that they would be able to, that they would be talking about global capitals with a, a high level of, deg- of um, knowledge and intimacy. But I was not really anticipating the level of, uh, the, the total level of intellect and um, the historical knowledge and the intimacy with which they talked about uh, events of geopolitics that I was not familiar with, um, and I, I've studied all of this quite a bit. Um, they, were, they were so incredibly knowledgeable and sophisticated and smart, and I found myself, I, I was, I'm ashamed to say, that I was a little bit surprised, um, because in my mind, the job had been, I, I had fully digested uh, the pop culture image that, uh, that I think women of my age have about uh, former stewardesses, that you know, they were more interested in, in shopping or... Um, you know, traveling, which I very much respect, uh, but that 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 they weren't necessarily in it for um, for the smarts, if if I'm going to be honest. Um, and I I was I I was ashamed that I was surprised, 
Um, but I was, and I wanted to dig into that and, and find out why I, I had been surprised and, and how these women had become who they were and um, and how they had come to know so very much. So uh, that was what really inspired me to start working on the book. Um, and I can only assume that, that I, I'm not alone in that in that sense of perspective. I think that m- for many of us, we're kind of aware that these women were interesting in some way, but the pop culture of the era has come to kind of overshadow that. Um, you know, they, they never really found a place for stewardesses in the feminist movement, even though um, stewardesses uh, really, you know, set the labor law precedent um, by, by um, as you kind of alluded to in your introduction, by suing the airlines in order to be able to dis- in, to keep working to dismantle some of these really sexist um, job requirements. So they they really did a lot for the feminist movement, but um, but have kind of been, you know, shall we say, sleeper agents. It's interesting because because it was such a self-selecting population. Because the criteria, as as you outlined before, was was so specific, and 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 really, it was the cream of the crop. That in many ways, and, and probably the realization didn't exist to Pan Am or even Pan Am executives at the time, that it it sort of sowed the seeds for its own problems later on. It absolutely did. Yeah, that's a really good way to to look at it. It. it um you know, it was really what what I found so interesting about you know as I was looking at the labor law aspect of this book, um, the women who brought these lawsuits against the airlines they they hadn't brought lawsuits about the weight requirements or the um, or, or anything like that. They brought lawsuits against the fact that they were expected to um, quit when they got married or uh, turned thirty five. Um, on Pan Am, and and really, what, what it was was that they didn't have a problem with having to adhere to certain rules about their appearance, even though those were also pretty blatantly sexist rules. Um, they they wanted they just wanted to keep lying. They wanted to keep being able to do their jobs. They had they took issue with the the perception, you know, and, and the reason why they had been expected to quit at marriage or um, you know turning thirty five was that they could continue to be seen as sex objects by um, by the clientele, um, and. And, you know, it, that was what chafed. That was what they, they took issue with. They, they wanted to just be able to keep doing their job as long as they could perform it um, competently. And, and they certainly could into their late 30s, 40s, and on. Um, so they, they really, they loved their jobs. They really did. Talk about how they, the, the stewardesses, saw the clientele of the day, how they looked upon all of these people, mostly men, as you mentioned before, that they had to deal with. You know, for the most part, they really enjoyed, especially at Pan Am, they really enjoyed um, the getting to know the passengers. Um, it, uh, the frequent flyers were, were mostly men, but the flyers in general were, were all sorts of people. And especially on Pan Am, because they were flying, you know, round-the-world flights, um, that means that not every leg started or ended in the United States. In fact, um, very, relatively few of their uh, legs uh, of the journeys started in the U.S. Um, they could be flying from, for example, Lisbon to the African continent. Um, and so their passengers were all sorts of people. And that was one of the great, great wonders that these women were telling me about, that they, they really appreciated and, and enjoyed being able to get to know people from all walks of life, um, from all around the world. Uh, and, you know, you, you couldn't get to know someone very well in a, you know, a short flight. But they really um, they enjoyed being able to to see how people um, how people were how people interacted. It, it was kind of a crash course in in cultural diplomacy, if you will. Those like the three women that you profile in the book and 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 others that you talk to, how did they view the way what job they had, the way what they did is perceived today? Because the culture has changed so much. Yeah, you know, for the most part, they kind of laugh about it. They know who they are. Um, they, it's interesting when this book came out. Um, there was one article that seemed to really miss the point, and it 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 it, um, it talked about uh, how these these stewardesses had become playgirls. Um, and I, in my mind, I was thinking, you know, that is exactly what I'm trying to disprove. <laughs> you are you are missing the point entirely. Um, and you know, one of the women who is in my book forwarded me that article, and I, I felt I felt terrible. I, I was I was embarrassed because she was one of the she, she was an, she's an incredibly serious, incredibly smart woman. She's you know in her 80s today. She takes court, Harvard online courses. She's incredibly sharp. 
Um, and, you know, I, I, she, she wrote back and she just, she, she thought it was funny. Um, she, she knows who she is. She knows who her colleagues are. And, and while I think she can understand that that kind of continued objectification does no one any good, um, she doesn't, you know, once it's in the world, she's not someone who, um, who is going to waste her, her time or her brain cells thinking about it, which I, I really respected. Talk a little bit about the airline itself, about Pan Am, and I guess your father was an executive at Pan Am. How, how the airline looked at this job, what, what they wanted to sell, what they saw as the role of these women. So P- Pan Am really considered its stewardesses, um, you know, as diplomats um, in a way that they, if, if you look at the training manuals, the word diplomacy just appears on almost every page. They viewed um, food service as a small act of diplomacy. They viewed um, ushering uh, clients to their, passengers to their seats as an act of diplomacy. Um, they, you know, they showed, in, on one of, one of my favorite um, pages of the training manual shows all of the different fraternal organizations pins and 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 you know it showed it told the women to memorize the appearance of each of the pins and if they saw two passengers uh on board boarding an, an airplane who were wearing pins from the same fraternal organization they should approach one of them in flight and ask if they wanted to meet um the other person so that that kind of that level of um diplomacy was really encouraged um, on Pan Am, and then you know they were also this. This is another incredible aspect of the training manuals. They were taught um, the physics of flight because they uh, they were told that passengers were often going to be anxious, especially first time flyers, and so they were expected to know to, how to explain exactly how the plane was moving through the air by the jet propulsion, um, so that they could help calm a passenger down with with logic. So you know that that level of Pan Am really did respect the intellect of its um, stewardesses. On the one hand, on the other hand, there were uh, you know in, in some of the corporate communications that I saw, there was certainly a degree of um, you know the same objectification that was happening all across the industry. But um, but it was certainly a little bit less overt on Pan Am. How did Pan Am set the standard by which other airlines followed? Pan Am was an airline of first. On, on a technical level, um, it was the first uh, airline to, in the 1920s, for example, use radio um, to serve meals in the air. It was the first to operate permanent international flights. In the 30s, it was the first to operate a scheduled transatlantic passenger service. In the 40s, to run a war- round-the-world flight or to provide tourist class service outside of the U.S. The list goes on. Um, so Pan Am really did uh, pioneer uh, the American airline industry. And was this something that was intentional? Was it really Pan Am's goal to to be the first to set the standards for all these things? Yeah, it it was. One trip was was a visionary, and you know, my book is not a, a biography of him. Certainly, far from it. Um, so you know, it, it's not you're not gonna it's not gonna go in in depth about how and why. But but he really was a, a visionary American, you know, titan of industry. One of the other things that you talk about is the relationship between Pan Am and the U.S. government, and 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 it brings back this whole diplomatic issue that you were talking about before. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Juan Trip had a really strong uh, relationship with the U.S. government. One of the presidents, I think it was FDR, called him um, the the he called him the most uh, charismatic Yale gangster he ever met, or some something along those those lines. Um, he was really determined to um, to make Pan Am into what he called the chosen instrument, um, and by that he meant the chosen in- instrument of um, American interests abroad. So he really, you know, leaned into the needs of the U.S. government throughout different conflicts in the early um, and mid 20th centuries. Um, so, and that included the Vietnam War. Um, once he, that was even that was when he he was handing off the reins to. Um, to other other leaders who followed him at the airline, um, but but Pan Am really was seen as not if not not an arm of the U.S. government, but but certainly um, the airline on which the government leaned. And Pan Am welcomed that. It wasn't anything that was resisted at the time. No, it was very welcomed. It was it was what Pan Am Pan Am was honored to do that um, in a way. Von Tripp wanted to do that, um, and and you know he he handpicked leaders who who felt the same way and who wanted to implement that um, that relationship with the U.S. government. Were you surprised as as you look at this period and and certainly the history of Pan Am and 
the focus on, on the flight attendants, the stewardesses that we're talking about, how little of, of that environment still exists within the airline industry today? Yeah, it, it's interesting. My father would, would be the first to point out that none of the trunk airlines from the of the mid-20th century still exist today, that Pan Am is far from the only airline to... Um, to go under to be a casualty of um, a changing industry. The reality is that most countries around the world have what's called a a flag carrier, um, and that's an airline that's um, subsidized by the government and and related to uh, the national national interest. And uh, we don't. We we have an open marketplace, and and that's very – it's very difficult for um, an airline to to get through that – So, you know, we can talk as much as we want about a lack of glamour in the industry today, but but we we pay the price. We literally pay the prices for that. Um, We have incredibly cheap air travel. It's interesting, though, to see the way some of that glamour still exists in small amounts with some of these other flag carriers. Certainly. Um, And I think it, it also... You know, it exists in small amounts here sometimes, too. And I know there are... Um, Very small amounts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, certainly, it, it, to me, the more I, I read about it, the more it really, the job itself is just the the, um, the expectations that we put on flight crew. Is, it's, it's Herculean. It's unbelievable when you think about it. These are the people who are tasked with ensuring our safety, first and foremost, and yet we view them as, you know... We, we should be able to boss them around or ask them to help us to make our experiences more comfortable. In reality, you know, their 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 job is our safety. Um, so as long as they're doing that and they're well prepared, you know, to address any eventuality, um, then then we're doing okay. The other part of it that's that's fundamentally different is is the sheer scale that that in you know the days of Pan Am. Even when the first 747s came on, what, 69, 70, something like that, that that the number of passengers that they're dealing with is just so many more today. It, it is. And the, the speed with which, um, you know, the, 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 the uh, flight schedules are just insane. Um, it, it's really, you know, again... We, we we expect now to be able to choose between, you know, 17 different flight times to get from, you know, Boston to Chicago or, or whatever else. We want to be able to choose our, our schedules, um, and, and there's a cost to that. One of the other things that you talk about with respect to the stewardess is that not only did they get to travel on the flights that they were working, but they did a lot of other traveling on their own, that they took advantage of being part of the airline. They absolutely did. They, they loved it. Um, if you think about it, it, it was a self-selecting group of people who really were all very curious about the world and really motivated to see it, to get out into it. Um, so, you know, the, the job as it was performed, you know, we're talking about how um, how difficult the job is today. It was difficult back then, too. They were... Um, they were constantly jet lagged. They were on their feet for many, many hours at a time. They had to be on, um, and you know, able to handle both safety demands and customer service demands. Um, and so it, it was not an easy job. But for these women, the benefits so outweighed the um, the, the downsides, uh, in part largely because of of what they could see and do while they were traveling. They loved, you know, these were women who really took advantage of going to see monuments and markets and um, historical places and, and nightclubs also. And, um, you know, they they knew the expat circles in Hong Kong and Monrovia, Liberia, and um, all around the world. There, there was one person you quote, I, I don't remember who, talking, to, this, this was traveling obviously not on, on a flight crew, but traveling separately, that she only bought a one-way ticket because you never know. Yeah, no, and the sense of spontaneity um, was, was incredible. You know, to some extent, I, I do have a, a level of intimate knowledge of this kind of spontaneity because it's what I grew up with as, as the daughter of an airline person. Um, you know, I, I, airline families tend to travel very differently from the regular um, public in that, you know, when I was growing up, we flew standby everywhere. So my, my parents would pack us for hot or cold, um, and we would go to the airport and get on a plane to wherever whatever destination had four free seats. 
Um, so it, it's a very different way of traveling, um, and you know, these women loved it. They, they felt a degree of safety and security uh, that was conferred by the Pan Am name and by belonging to this um, this powerful corporation that was, you know, a, 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 I quoted one CIA agent um, who I didn't speak to personally, but uh, that's quoted in a, another book about Pan Am, saying that um, Pan Am around the world was more uh, more recognizable than Coca Cola in its day. So these women were part of a, a very a much they, they felt a, a high degree of safety um, traveling in in all around the world, um, and that was that was really special. That was unique. That was completely unprecedented for um, women traveling in the 1960s. What was the relationship between these women and the pilots and the other people in the flight deck? Um, they, they were, they were very collegial. Um, they had, they had, you know, there were flight, there were crew parties in, in plenty of different, um, places. You know, they tended to, to debrief around a bottle of some alcoholic <laughs> beverage and, and, and take it from there. Was this a fun adventure to go on for you with learning about this? Absolutely. It, it was, it was great fun. Um, you know, I, I tend to forget, uh, now after six years that I, when I began this research, part of my ulterior motive was that I wanted to learn how to um, how to how to grow old the way these women seemed to have done it. They they seemed so um, they really seemed contented with their lives. They seemed to have maintained a level of um, you know, youthful excitement about the world and about their lives that I found just remarkable. Um, and I wanted I wanted to capture that. I wanted to know it um, for me. And um, and I, I think I've learned a lot from them. Julia Cook, the book is Come Fly the World, the Jet Age Story of the Women of Pan Am. Julia, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. Thank you.